I wanted to ask a little bit more about what was going on in the Bay Area in the 60s and 70s. And um, did, you, did you know that, um, did you, had you heard anything about the Merry Pranksters when Stuart showed up to work for you? Did you know about that whole scene over the hill and what he was involved in? I don't know, but uh, I don't think it would have made much difference. <laughs> Yeah, but you don't remember. You don't remember the, the Ken Kesey crowd or the, yeah. the the Grateful Dead or. Sure, I remember them, but <clears throat> it just seemed kind of remote from what we were doing. Yeah. And, uh, and and um, was was Stuart Brand with you for very long, or it was a pretty narrow period when you were preparing? He came as a sort of consultant helper. Well, it was it was just. <laughs> Hey, we need somebody else to sweep or something at this time. Can you you spare a day? <laughs> and so it was a relatively unskilled thing of running a camera. Because we had, uh, the way we generate our displays, we had a whole array of video cameras, each of them looking at a small CRT. And that's how the video was generated out in the lab. And uh, there were definite advantages of that, technically, et cetera, that one computer could drive a lot more that way because that CRT could actually be blinking, but that you can adjust the camera so that it, it uh, is slow in response and it smooths it out for you here so that uh, you didn't have a blinking display, but the computer could write them all. Yeah, but you needed people and to help. Then, then we had those cameras available to move around and get studio shots sort of during the 68 demonstration. So we borrowed tripods and moving things, and we just needed some people that could could come and do that, and that's where he came from. Yeah, uh, because we'd we'd just been acquainted with him, and he was somebody that uh, would say, "Oh, sure, it'd be interesting to try that." Mm -hmm. Now, had you had any contact with the Whole Earth Catalog? Well, it, it, I don't think it was out yet. It was something he was working on, so he'd tell us about it, and uh, it's, it's sure that's neat to be trying that, but. But it grew and be something quite different from what he was telling us. It, it, he really had in mind, he, he wanted to have a catalog that would go out to all the experimental communities to tell them what they could buy. And it really turned out to be something quite different, but much more successful. And did you put yourself in the category of an experimental community? Were you thinking about the world in that context? Not, not in the way he was. He yeah. was right? Yours was a, a cyber community as opposed to right. a, yeah, right. yeah. yeah. You, you told me that being a manager was like the hardest thing. And I was wondering if you could sort of relate some of the war stories of, the, of just the, the hassles that you had to go through to, as, as part of managing the project. Well, I see there were two things. One is it was such a novel approach or something that the classical management as practiced in research communities or environments at that time didn't sort of hold very well because the picture of a lab manager was that he wanted to see that his researchers stayed employed. So mostly the contracts they would get would be two, three, one, two, three persons contracts and, and, and he'd help them be sure they, they, they were new aware of chances to write proposals and get the money and do the projects. And here we were working on one comprehensive program, see. And um, so uh, that's one difference. And the second place is I really didn't understand how to manage. It, you know, I just essentially was a farm kid wandered into this and had my own idea like that. So I wasn't good at that. And so some of the stresses that went on were just were, be, were because of that. Yeah. And, and what like, kinds of things would you? I mean, is this in terms of the sort of hiring and firing stresses, or or oh. getting people to do the right stuff that they committed to do? No, it was sort of more subtle than that. It was like uh, when somebody has a project, how do you have project meetings and reports? Or we get so many dollars coming in for this year for this, how do you get a budget set up so you know how many people you can hire? Boy, I never did find out how to make a budget, so it was always somebody like Bill English who would come to, well, we can just use it to do this and this. And then also the specific projects, how to, how to build something. I just didn't know about because I'd never had the experience of working in an environment where you, you sort of, hey, by this time you do what and get it sketched out. So it was a very loose kind of way to do it, which in one way let a lot more creativity go on, but in, in another way could 
make it very frustrating for the people working in the lab. Yeah. Now Licklider, I mean, he didn't come to you as a manager. He came to you because of this particular idea. Right. And where, where did you meet Licklider for the first time? I think it was probably um, when he had that job there um, at, at he, ARPA. He but came I, and visited. Well, I think I might have gone there. Okay. But had he already seen your report at that point, so he knew a little bit about your ideas before you? Well, I think it was when we write a proposal that goes there. Here's the whole kit that goes along and supports it. And uh, I'm not sure whether, you, I, I can't remember well enough, but you know, that 1962 report that's fairly thick and uh, it just had the essence in it of almost everything since a lot of which hasn't been able to flourish in concepts out there. But Licklider had seen that report. I, I'm, I'm sure it must have been included in a bundle that went along with the proposal. Yeah. Um, so I don't know how much it... See, the big difference in there from pre current time at that time and still a factor is that uh, so many... At that time, everyone was talking about automation and especially in the 70s, it's automating the office place. And uh, the concepts that I'd emerged with, because of the scaling experience studying like that, this is going to be so big, we're going to just be, so many things are going to get changed in our rest of our world, we can't think of it as just automating, because there are going to be all these other changes, we have to do the co-evolution of the two sides. And you say, all of this stuff augments our basic human, you know, genetically endowed capabilities. And did you know about, did you know about Memex? Yeah. So I, you, had, you had had contact with the ideas? Well, as a matter of fact, I discovered, I was sitting in a, uh, in a camp by the edge of the jungle in the, in the sea in Philippines in 1945 and waited to get reassigned out there someplace in the Navy. And I'd wandered into this Red Cross library that was up on a uh, of Jap a Filipino native hut, Red Cross library, and there, of course, there was nobody around. Somehow, no other sailors were <laughs> interested in the library, so that's where I was hanging out for a couple of days. And I found the Life magazine with that article in it, and uh, it was really, I really just said, "Gee, that's terrific." But but when I actually started working through and came up with the sort of much more explicit ideas of what we wanted to do, came from this thing of looking looking at all this set of things, the list of, from the way your organizations are structured to the conventions, to the roles in your organization, to your language, to your skills, to your learning, uh, all of that, that all of those are subject to change. And I said, wow, there are going to be surprises every place. Where would you want to focus first? So I picked on the language and uh, focus. The, the, you know, the idea of how do you take the concepts that are so important part of our mechanism in here and externalize them, and we use language in now, but boy, externalizing them in a computer could be very different because in the first place, a computer could help you externalize them, and it could also help you portray them and manipulate them and communicate them. Now, do you think it's possible that, that you evolved Bush's ideas from running across them in, 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 in that Atlantic well, magazine? But I, I, just, I don't, was familiar I don't with remember. Them. When I went through that and thought of all the different ways, and the citation ability is something was just right in there like that, and I don't have a conscious memory of connecting it back there, but it's, it's, it's okay with me if it were sitting there unconscious or something like that, because that was a very good idea. But, but now Licklider had run across Bush's <laughs> ideas as well. And do you think it's possible that he saw your efforts to develop some of those ideas when he saw your report? I don't know. No way of knowing. Yeah. yeah. And you, did you guys, when you went back there and talked to them, what, what, what was on his mind when you visited? Well. He was charged with trying to get something going, in a new kind of program that there wasn't any precedent. And uh, <coughs> the um, interactive computing and very soon time sharing, so the computers could support more than one person at a time interacting. And um, so, you know, other proposals coming in were how you do time sharing and how you do artificial intelligence that's going to make computers so smart you don't have to have an interface or something. <laughs> um, so it was just sort of fit into his domain, so it's almost like he was shamed. And <laughs> I think he liked me. We, you know, he was like a big brother for me. 
But some years later, it turned out that our perceptions about how this should work were just very different. It's, when he came by again in 75 or 76, someplace in there, he was for a short period of time back with ARPA. We were so proud. We were, we'd been supporting customers over there. We'd actually gotten to the point where I was hiring women like Anne you know, had liberal arts education and could be the trainers and support persons. So not a software guy, but somebody going like that and telling him about all this. And he was straightening up in his chair like this. And, um, well, what's the matter, Lick? He says, you just told me that your system's no damn good, see? And all our jaws just dropped. He says, well, what do you mean? He says, if it was any good at all, you wouldn't need people that have to show people how it does it. The, the system itself would give them everything they need. And it just dumbfounded us. You know, what his picture was, no one, no one else, even in the AI, had anything even simple in the way of doing that. So... Uh, Were his expectations unreasonable? Is that where, I mean, he sort of was out of touch? Oh, I, I mean, show us an example of something that really has the kind of utility you're going to want yeah. that you do that. And even today, they don't do what he was assuming you could do. I mean, yeah. And it just really dumbfounded me because I thought we had seen things very close to each other, but that was part of the collapse of... Had his vision changed or was he just not in touch? I don't know. See, we, uh, More on the, on the history of the period during the anti-war movement, were you ever worried about the physical safety of the systems that you'd built? Not really. <laughs> um, I guess I just remember one event, uh, maybe they were more of looking out and seeing all the crowd out there uh, of students protesting and making noise. And uh, I guess it occurred to me if they, if they broke in, but I, I just don't think I could imagine it. And I'd, I'd faced a mob of students once before. <laughs> you said you'd faced a mob of students. What, what happened? Well, this was... Uh, uh, it was at Oregon State University where I went back to finish after the war. And uh, I joined a fraternity. And somehow a lot of the veterans really got uh, anti-fraternity or something. And uh, I joined because my brother belonged, but it turned out to be a terrific experience for me. But somehow one night, they'd been going to make trouble, one night there were about 80 of them making noises right across the street and shouting, cheering like that. So it was sort of like, what are they going to do? Ch charge us, tear things down? And, uh, and the really funny difference there was that the younger kids who hadn't been in the service, boy, let's get baseball bats, we'll take them on. And the veterans were all saying, hey, cool it, man. Somebody can get hurt, you know. <laughs> but but it, anyway, it was just watching it to realize that, that even if it could sound pretty ominous or something like that, that it takes a lot for them to actually um, break and start assaulting things, so I, I didn't worry. But there was only, you only remember the one anti-war demonstration that came anywhere close to SRI. That's all I remember. Right. But you must have run into them all over the peninsula. Yeah, and, um, and a funny thing like this was I was at that time traveling around the country talking to different universities, trying to get more picked people aware of what the network was going to be able to do, because we had this role in the network like that. And uh, I remember going to Harvard and other universities who all looked down their nose at what you guys have going on in the West Coast, you know, what a bunch of dissolute people you have like that. <laughs> and two years later I get there to Harvard and I can't get to the place where I'm going inside of Harvard because there's a student riot going on. <laughs> and I thought it was just another sign that they were behind it. <laughs> and 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 you um, you were never challenged when you spoke around the country by people who thought that you were doing war work or anything like that, where you, you didn't have to face that kind of. No, it was just. Uh, it, it you know, as I think I said earlier, that none of the people involved in doing any of this network thing or anything like that were fixed on it being just a military thing at all. Uh, it's, uh, you know, they were all talking, like Licklider would be talking about, you know, what we really ought to call this is the beginning of the galactic network, see? And he was using that term quite often, so it just... And 
you bought into that idea as well. That, oh, that made sense to you. For me, the whole thing was what it would do for this kind of collaborative knowledge work and exchange, just, just like what the web's doing now. See? Just, uh, in fact, I remember in some meeting in my lab, I'd try to tell them that you know, the real test is going to be when we actually start supporting the distributed communities and how do we get a community connected like this. See? And boy, when I heard them talking about this, this experimental network, it just, oh, it was terrific. And One of the things that Bill and Ann have said at the, is that out of the Augment group, there, there were lots of relationships that emerged. Yeah. Any sense? What was special about your group? I mean, is that just normal of any group that, that's that close together? Or was there some special chemistry that was going on? I don't think it was normal. Um, there was something different because, uh, because the whole laboratory was involved in a fairly unified thing building and using and testing and evaluating, et cetera, the system. And the people out in the field were sort of a trained how they send in field reports about bugs that show up. And, uh, you know, well, the, the software guys fixed up a special ways in which those messages could then be handled, et cetera. So it was very unified and very different from the outside world and made a coherence. And um, so it just, you know, didn't surprise me that these things appear because did, did it feel like a family a lot? Yeah. Did you feel like you were a patriarch in some sense? They used to, when they changed the name to the Augmentation Research Center, then it's ARC, and so of course I would get called Noah every once in a while. See. <laughs> were you comfortable with that? Oh, well, it's okay. Except uh, I really didn't feel like I was the leader very much. It was um, pointing and such as that, but a lot of cases of, of things that got innovated in there that are very significant is I remember the time when somebody had come and says, well, here's what we're doing now. We're, we've got this remote procedure call that we need to work and stuff like that. Oh, what's a remote procedure call? Well, they'd have to explain it to me, something like that. And so, oh, that sounds like a good idea. So there were just a lot of spontaneous good things that would... But uh, from almost everybody who was in your group, um, I get the sense that they really res respected you as the keeper of the vision. And well, that's that that's was right. your point. Was that's the vector. Never, yeah, you know, never. It just, it's just been there almost 50 years now. That just, and uh, trying and trying to find a way to, uh, to f characterize it and formulate a strategic thing that the world could really do that would go after it. And, you know.